Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Batman Gotham by Gaslight. A tale of the Batman, written by Brian Augustin and brought to life by Mike Mignola, comes a tale from the Victorian era where Batman is hunting down Jack the Ripper. Your evening attire, sir. That was not the suit I need Alfred. So it's 1889, and while these murders of women are happening all over the place, the general public whispers in the wind that it may be Batman who is committing these crimes. Okay, so we got historic serial murders, we got old-timey gangs, Bruce gets framed, the candlelit mystery is a foot. I loved this one shot, honestly. It's really hard to put down as soon as you start. If you have time, at least watch the animated film, because you owe it to yourself. A lot of candlelit. Ah, which way did he go? It's good. It's right up your alley. You'll love it. And before we go on to number nine, guys, if you could go ahead and toss this video a thumbs up, or else we'll be using candles to light this place up, just like Gotham by Gaslight. And we can't have that. You guys are literally the best. Thank you for your support. Number nine, the doom that came to Gotham. So written by the lovely Mike Mignola and Hellboy creator Richard Pace comes a tale taking place in 1928. All these old tales, I love it. So we have Bruce Wayne after he pieced out after the death of his parents. So now, 20 years later, he's returned and he has to get pretty dark to take out the Lovecraftian horror known as the Lurker on the Threshold. This is a three issue mini series and it's a dark, weird, fast paced adventure. I mean, we have demons that come into the plot, like demons, so you should know what you're getting into, especially if you're a fan of McDowell's other work, Gotham by Gaslight, which I mentioned one second ago. Number eight, Batman I Joker. This one is a trip. Okay, so we have the Bruce, the Bruce. And he was dumped into a vat of chemicals way back when, and now we see the bat as the crazy antagonist, which already is super fun. Everybody's all like, I'll hail the Bruce. Hail the God King of Gotham. And he's quite messed up. Yeah, he's like calling out other Gotham citizens, challenging them to kill his enemies before he gets to them himself. It's wild, it's like Mad Max, crazy. And if this isn't wacky enough for you, he wants everybody to challenge him. He wants them to earn the chance to become a god by defeating him in combat. That plus some resurrected villains, it really gets the Hunger Game vibes going. So if you're into some death sport like reading, this is an ideal one shot. Bob Hall created a quite fun story here. I swear to God. Swear to me. And number seven, Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Knights in a Half Shell. Yes, just saying that out loud. I'm like, ooh, let's do it. This comic is so fun. It's written by James Tinian IV. Right off the bat, we see a pizza delivery guy as he drops off the za. And then of course, there's a note that says, leave it on the street. And then we see turtle hands creep up out of the sewer. Yep, they come across the Batmobile. And then shortly after, they come across Batman himself. It's a pretty serious take as well. I mean, I know it looks fun because you're like, Ninja Turtles, Batman, sick. Which some fans didn't like how serious it was, but others rejoiced that they could dig their teeth into something after watching the Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated movie. It's a pretty slow start, but once it gets cooking, it's a hell of a lot of fun. The Turtles were transported to Gotham, thanks to Krang, alongside their master, Splinter, and of course, arch enemy, Shredder. They set up camp in the sewers, of course, but our own Killer Croc stumbles upon them and then so begins this cat and mouse game with Batman and the turtles. So Batman finds one of Raphael's side during a fight and then Lucius Fox confirms it is from another universe. So the six issue series is a pretty short read but Freddie Williams art will keep you admiring the pages taking it much longer than you think. Number six, Justice Riders. Okay, this one was released back in 1997 by Chuck Dixon, and it's a wild tale of the wild, wild west. Justice Riders is a one shot that has the Justice League of America take on different roles. Like Wally West is an outlaw who's blamed for the death of Barry Allen. He's like a young guy too. And then Wonder Woman is the marshal. She's the old marshal in town. The 1873 story begins with Marshal Diana Prince, his hometown, Paradise. More like parrot dust. Am I right, fellows? <laughs> and it's destroyed by an alcoholic sorcerer named Felix Faust. So she wrangles up her super squad and hits the dirt, heading for El Inferno to get revenge. Wild West anything is a good time. There's a lot of hat tipping, we got sunsets, we got giant rocks that look like fingers coming out of the ground, and of course, we got some badass gun holsters and some hate chewing. There's rules when you read this one shot, though. You have to do the accent 
in your head the entire time. That's it. Do your worst Western accent the entire time. Number five, JSA, Liberty File. Okay, we got some Wild West hooting and hollering, but what about some World War II drama? So JSL Liberty File was written by Tony Harris and Dan Jolly and sees the interception of a parcel in which the contents could change the outcome of the war. And then we got Owl, Clock, and Bat stepping in to save the day. So Jack the Grin, known as the albino smuggler, which is what my friends called me when I would steal their supplies for school, he intercepts a n communicate and then hides it and then starts making bids on it. So this is a two-parter and it's fairly short, but it doesn't waste any time at all. The stakes are high like right off the bat. So we have these schematics for a new German long range bomber in the hands of the Joker, right? It's dark, we got some mysterious men in bowler hats and they're doing their mysterious men in bowler hat things, smoking and whispering in dark shadows. You already know what you're in for, it's a great time. Number four, Batman Gotham Noir. Coming from the minds of Ed Brubacher and drawn to life by Sean Phillips comes a pulp comic thriller. A notable difference here opposed to our usual Gotham tale is that it centers around Jim Gordon this time. And he doesn't have the best luck. And he's heavy into the booze. He's a private investigator who gets framed for murder as well. So those are the three things you just want in life right there. Fans are actually super excited to see these themes come spiraling down to this perfect crime story. It's dark, it's gritty, and most of all, it's realistic. They made Gotham quite interesting here as well because they didn't shoot necessarily for a superhero theme. Right, so Jim Gordon finds himself sharing his life story with the only person that'll listen, not God, the Bat. So now Batman already is a noir character, so I'm glad they put the focus more on Gordon here. It felt fresh. You kinda expect it to go one way, but it doesn't, and that's the best part. Number three, Superman speeding bullets. From J.M. DiMatteis and Eduardo Barreto comes the ultimate question of, what would have happened if Superman was discovered by the Waynes of Gotham instead of the Kansas Kents? So right off the hop, we see the usual scenario playing out. We got the alleyway, we got the mugger with the gun, and then when it comes down to the mugger shooting Bruce as well, because he cried and he just hates when kids cry, the bullets don't penetrate his skin and his wet eyes look up at the mugger and then those wet eyes turn bright red. Yeah, he zapped the shit out of him. <laughs> Laser eyes for the win. So this Batman is now angry. It cuts to him being older and he remembers that he could have saved his parents and it eats him alive. That plus these Superman abilities that he now has, it makes for a very, very entertaining ride. Number two, Flashpoint. Okay, so one of the biggest upcoming DC movies, and for good reason, the storyline where the Flash tries to go back in time to save his mother from her tragic death, which is not a bad idea at all. This story was released in 2011, written by Jeff Johns and Andy Kubert, and it starts with Barry waking up with no Flash powers. In fact, the Flash doesn't even exist. In fact, everything has changed. His mother, Nora, was still alive. Sick. And his father, Henry, died three years prior. Oh. Yeah, so in his own timeline, his dad's actually alive and in jail, but we know this, right? There's no Justice League, and Superman isn't even in the picture. The best part and one plot point that we're most looking forward to in the movie is that Batman in this universe is actually Thomas Wayne, Bruce Wayne's father. So Bruce ended up dying that night, causing his mother, Martha, to go insane, and then she becomes a Joker. That's why during the opening credits of Batman vs Superman, we were all hyped because we saw Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Lauren Cohen, two huge actors in such a small opening scene with zero dialogue. So everyone's like, huh, that must have been an expensive day to shoot. Yeah, it was. They had bigger plans for them down the future. And now with recent news of Michael Keaton set to return in the Flashpoint movie, Jeffrey Dean Morgan took to the internet and said, eh, Michael Keaton swooped in and took my gig. Now, I think that's super cool. Ever since Zack Snyder walked away, my whole kind of bit in that world has walked away with him. However, there's always a chat going on. There is, there's always a chat. May I peek into this chat, sir? Because we'd love to see that. We've been kind of begging for it. I don't know. It'll be good either way. We'll see, we shall see. I mean, we'll see it June 2nd, 2022. For now, if it's not delayed even more. <laughs> and finally, number one. Justice League, the nail. If you own a car, first of all, congrats. Secondly, you must know the pain of getting a flat tire. It's always at the worst times too, right? Well, imagine if a flat tire was the sole reason Lil Cal L was never found. Yeah, coming from the mind of Alan Davis, we see this unfold and lead the world into a much, much different way of living without Superman, without hope. So now Lex Luthor doesn't have anybody to go toe to toe with, so that led to him becoming the beloved mayor of Metropolis. 
The Justice League are to be feared as well. The world has a lot of hatred towards metahumans and aliens. It's great how the Silver Age heroes also kept their costumes in this as well, because they're a lot of fun in this Elseworlds story. We see Alan Davis revisit big players like the Outsiders and Batman, which he drew in the 80s. So I definitely recommend adding it to the list, and that's why I put it on number one of our list. Number 10, Superman Jr. is no more! Exclamation point. Remember that time that Superman Jr. quit? No? Well, you can if you read this Elseworld story. This is another Elseworld story out of the Elseworld's 80 page giant from the 90s. Seriously, this book is chock full of interesting and strange stories. In this one, Superman Jr. ends up quitting the superheroic game, much to Batman Jr.'s dismay, believing his dad will be around forever, so he's not needed. He's like, I quit, I'm over this. My dad's got this for life, for longer than life. I think you know where this is going next. Superman appears to die while taking an full of dangerous missiles to safety in the emptiness of space to explode in. Supes Jr. then feels terrible, misses his dad, the whole world goes into a tizzy, and eventually Superman Jr. is inspired to return. I don't know if people use the word tizzy anymore, but I just did, so there you go. I'm making it a thing again. He helps Batman Jr. save some guys from an earthquake where they end up being trapped under tons of rock and snow. In the end, however, it's revealed that Superman faked his death in order to influence his son to return to his job as a hero, and everyone has a good laugh about it. Ha 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 ha! Oh, faking your death is such good fun. This story also features such amazing lines as Bat Guy slash Bat Jr. I kid you not, he is called Bat Guy in this comic, asking Supes Jr., What's the true poop on this? And Superman Jr. responding, with a rhyme. Rhyming on your father's grave, Superman Jr. How distasteful. Number 9, DMT's rockumentary, The Lex Record Story. How about a story where we get the history of how Lex became the head of the most successful record label ever, representing all kinds of superheroic musician talent, and how he ended up selling the label to Darkseid. That is another story which comes to us from the Elseworld 80 page giant, and it is a delight. I promise I'm gonna have other stories that are not from this comic, but just let me get these out of the way, my friends. They're just so good. What a strange story this is. One wherein Superman is part of a super heroic beetle like group with Barry Allen, Green Arrow, and Aquaman. Oh, and he's the John Lennon of the group who is tragically killed. And I never knew I needed to see Martian Manhunter as a rock star, but I definitely did need that, and so do you. And before I move on to our number eight, if you are enjoying this list, be sure to let us know and show it by giving this video a thumbs up. It really does help us out here at Top 10 Nerd. Number eight, Superman slash Batman. Absolute power. This comic is an interesting one. We are talking about a world in this story arc where Superman and Batman were reimagined as the only heroes. Both of their parents were wiped out at a young age and Superman was never raised by the Kents. Instead they were taken in and raised by Saturn Queen, Lightning Lord, and Cosmic King of the Legion of Supervillains. They created a fascist world which they collectively ruled with an iron fist, eliminating any and all opposing heroes who rose up or attempted to do so anyways. If if you don't believe me, just look at the end of the first issue in this arc which ends with Wonder Woman awakening and recruiting Uncle Sam. Yep, that's just how this story do. Number 7, Son of Superman. The 1999 Son of Superman tells a story where John Kent works alongside a group called the Supermen to discover the truth behind what really happened to his father, all as he's realizing just who his father really was, which his mom, Lois Lane, kept a secret, and as he's just realizing himself that he has superpowers. He doesn't even initially realize that Clark Kent and Superman were the same person, but initially instead suspects his mother was having an affair with the costumed hero Superman. Oh boy, John. <laughs> In the end, they discovered that his father is still alive and had been kidnapped and held prisoner all these years by Lex Luthor with help from Martian Manhunter. Ooh, it does not look good on you, Martian Manhunter. It's not very nice. In the end, this plot is revealed and despite John being new to heroics, he goes up against Lex and the good guys end up prevailing. My favorite part admittedly is when John calls Lex's ponytail outdated. So 90s. <laughs> Just gotta love that. Also, I just love that Lex has a ponytail in this. I also just love that this story ends with most of the older crew of soups retiring, paving the way for a new era of supers like John himself. For me, Elseworld stories that end like this, I'm like, I wish this could be the way of DC. Just let some of these people retire. Let's get some new, some fresh blood in here. We've got a lot of sons and daughters and such. 
Number 6, Batman in Darkest Night. All my Tales of the Dark Multiverse fans out there are likely already familiar with this story, if not the original telling of it, then at least the dark retelling of it. You might know the version of Bruce Wayne from Earth Negative 32, but for this multiverse story, we're talking about the version of Bruce that inspired him from the non-dark Earth, just Earth 32. No negatives needed. This version of Bruce is introduced to us in Batman in Darkest Night, a 90s comic that gave us an alternate story, one where Bruce Wayne, instead of becoming Batman, becomes the Green Lantern in Hal Jordan's place, being chosen by Abin Sur instead. In this reality, Sinestro becomes Green Lantern Bruce Wayne's biggest foe, and the Joker never existed, as Green Lantern prevents the accident which created him at Ace Chemicals. Here, Catwoman is also Star Sapphire, which I honestly just need more artwork in my life of that whole thing. I'm just like, more Catwoman Star Sapphire artwork, please. Give it to me. Number five, Batman slash Captain America. This has got to be one of my favorite stories out there. It's the team up we've all been waiting for, Batman and Captain America together. I actually love when these two team up. Here we see them taking on each other's main nemesis featuring Cap's Red Skull and Bat's Joker. There is also a bit of a sidekick swap where Cap partners with Robin and Batman partners with Bucky. And in the end, of course, even Joker admits that Red Skull is so evil, even he is not interested in working with him. He may be a criminal lunatic, but he is an American criminal lunatic. When it comes to German World War II soldiers, even Joker isn't interested in crossing that line. And in the end, he and Red Skull end up squaring off themselves and fighting one another as well after Joker finds out Red Skull's true allegiance. I just love the Joker's like, I might be crazy, but like, this is too crazy for me. <laughs> Not about that. Number four, Batman slash Houdini, The Devil's Workshop. For all my Gotham by Gaslight fans out there, here's another stylistically appealing Elseworlds story for you. This one evokes the feel of watercolors and also has some really pretty letters. It's really pretty to look at and features Batman teaming up with Houdini to fight vampires. What more could you you want, I ask you. It also gives us a cool alternate Joker with Mad Jack Schadenfreude. The art is truly so good here, I must share with you the names responsible. Howard Chaikin and John Francis Moore are the writers with art by Mark Chiarello and letters by Ken Brusenak. Just a stunning read. You gotta check it out. Number three, DC The New Frontier. Not only is this a beautiful world to get lost in, it is super stylized by the late and great Darwin Cook who passed away in 2016. This Elseworld story paints our heroes as outlaws operating in the post-Korean War time period, where space is truly the new frontier. And being that it is, the story here is primarily led by protagonists and heroes Martian Manhunter and Hal Jordan. Also, I just gotta say, I love when Martian Manhunter gets to be like the main protagonist in a story. I feel like we don't, we don't hear enough from him usually. Maybe I just need to read more of his standalone series. Maybe that's what I need to do. The art style is simple and classic and I also just really love the explosive use of color as well. It's a visually compelling series that I highly recommend checking out. Number 2, Earth 2. Earth 2 is home to many awesome heroes like Valzod, Superman, Power Girl, and Helena Wayne's Huntress. It is home to the superhero team known as the Wonders of the World. And while some of the original team is gone, we are introduced to new team members who take their place. And hey, we still got the golden oldie, Alan Scott. I personally am just a big fan of both Power Girl and Helena Wayne and their team ups together, so Earth 2 for me when it comes to alternate realities and worlds and their stories has got to be one of my favorites personally. Number one, Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come has to be one of the most beautiful Elseworlds stories that takes us to an alternate future where there is a great divide and sort of war in the superhero community, following Superman's choice to retire. He does end up returning to the world of heroics at the behest of Diana, aka Wonder Woman. Kingdom Come was a story originally written by Mark Wade in response to a rise of anti-heroes in the comic world. And in the story, this is exactly what you see some of the classic heroes like Superman, Wonder Woman, and Alan Scott go up against. These new heroes whose ideologies are much more harsh and violent by comparison. Much more edgy. The artwork of course is done by one of the most amazing artists to this day in the biz, Alex Ross, and is all hand painted. We also get to end it with of course, 
uh, Superman and Diana becoming parents of like a cool baby, and then also they're like, hey Batman, you wanna you wanna also help us raise this super baby? I just love that. I love the three of them like parenting together. I think that's adorable. Number ten, the reaching hand. The amount of bizarre deaths Jimmy Olsen has to suffer in alternate realities. My goodness. In this story featured in the Elseworlds 80 page giant from 1999, we see Bruce Wayne acting as a Lovecraftian detective, aiming to unravel the mystery that is the alleged murder of a elongated man. In reality, something far more dark and sinister has taken hold of the hero and is using him as its vessel to spread darkness throughout the city and take hold of other innocent souls. It reminds me a bit of the bizarre and campy 90s film Cast a Deadly Spell. Like most Lovecraft inspired horror stories, this one ends with a foreboding cliffhanger. <gasps> that face. I love that face. Bruce Wayne's face at the end, he's like, oh, what will happen? You're dead. You're gonna die. It's not gonna be good. Number 9. Teen Titans The Lost Annual This strange story has a campy 60s feel to it. It was originally slated to be released in the early 2000s as an Elseworld special for Teen Titans, but was later delayed. In the end, it was released in 2008 where it would be referred to in the title as a Lost Annual. But originally, it was intended to be an Elseworld special, so I'm gonna count it. Here, the Teen Titans team up to try and save President John F. Kennedy, who has been kidnapped by by space aliens and replaced by some kind of double. The whole adventure is pretty wacky, which honestly is what makes it so enjoyable. You know me, I love wacky adventures. Reminds me a bit of an original series Star Trek episode. And in case you haven't gathered by now, TOS is my favorite of the Star Treks, so yes. Although I am finally watching Discovery now, so I guess we'll see what happens. And before we move on to our number eight spot, a quick thank you to all of you for joining me this list and a reminder to click that like if you want more videos like this one. I personally love exploring Elseworlds with you. So I'd love to do more about it. Number eight, Elseworlds Finest, Supergirl and Batgirl. This one is kind of ridiculous, but also has some pretty powerful and epic moments. In this Elseworlds story, both Superman and Batman do not exist. Kal-El was destroyed before he could become Superman, though Kara Zor-El still made it to Earth. She took his place as Metropolis' hero, becoming Supergirl. Bruce Wayne never became Batman either, and instead Barbara Gordon guards Gotham as Batgirl after her parents were murdered by accident instead of the Waynes, who were meant to be targeted. The two women join forces and take on a very sneaky Lex Luthor, who Supergirl had thought of as a close friend and ally initially, and a very jacked Joker. He's like, really jacked. Like, more jacked than you could probably imagine. He's also wearing like a little gym outfit, which is just something. Number seven, A Nation Divided. This Elseworld comic, Superman A Nation Divided, gives us a look at what Superman would be like if he was around during the Civil War and happened to be a Union soldier. In this story, Superman is known as Atticus Kent and ends up finding out he has superpowers during the Civil War. He quickly becomes the Union's new secret weapon and even takes both Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln on a little flight to give them a tour of the Capitol. I personally love when history and comics meld and Elseworld stories that posit what if superheroes were real and part of historical events. So for me, this was an interesting story and one that I enjoyed. The whole story is told through letters of various historical figures as well as Kent himself. Number 6, Thrill Killer. Set in the 60s, this Elseworld story follows a doomed Barbara Gordon and Dick Grayson, aka Richard Greystark, which is his actual name here. Although he still goes by Dick Grayson because comics. These two attempt to take on the Joker, who in this world is a woman known as Bianca Steeplechase. In the end, Robin is killed, but so seemingly is the Joker. Oddly enough, in this reality, it's actually Batwoman and Robin who end up inspiring Bruce Wayne to join them. He becomes Batman after Dick's demise. Barbara is also the one with the wealth in this Elseworld story. She is an heiress who became somewhat estranged from her father after the unsolvable murder of her mother. Barbara uses her wealth to purchase Wayne Manor, as in this reality, the Waynes actually lost their fortune during the Great Depression. Very period of them. Very period to lose all of your money during the Great Depression. Or now, during the now depression. <laughs> Number five, Red Rain. Red Rain has to be one of my all-time favorite Elseworlds tales. It also was an ongoing story that was told over the course of multiple graphic novels released throughout the 90s. In this story, Batman battles vampires but eventually succumbs to them when he is bitten and transformed himself into one of the creatures of the night. He still battles with his new monstrous nature, however, attempting to rebel against it. However, eventually the Joker pushes him too far, causing him to give into temptation and drink his foe's blood. I also like how this is rebel. 
This is like, get off my lawn, kids. I don't know why I do this when I say rebel. Batman attempts to make sure the Joker will never rise again as a vampire, but eventually it is revealed that he was somehow unsuccessful in preventing this from happening when we revisit this alternate Earth much later down the road. Fans of vampires are sure to also enjoy this world, but as a Batman fan, I also just love the extra layer of moral struggle that vampirism gives Batman. Number four, Earth three. Earth three is home to the crime syndicate, an alternate reality where instead of the Justice League members being heroes, they're villains. And instead of the Justice League, we have the crime syndicate. In the place of Wonder Woman on the team, we have Superwoman, an evil version of Lois Lane armed with her lasso of submission. Although I always like to think of it as a whip of submission, but that's, not, that's something else. <laughs> you guys can cut that. That might be too kinky. I don't know. I don't know if it's too kinky. You tell me, internet. You tell me. The heroes of this alternate Earth favor strength above all, and as such, only seek to dominate and rule those who they consider to be weaker than them. The crime syndicate themselves are composed of members Deathstorm, Owlman, Superwoman, and Ultraman currently. But evil versions of Aquaman, known on this alternate Earth as Sea King, and The Flash, known here as Johnny Quick, were also part of the team at a time. I miss Johnny Quick. R.I.P. Johnny Quick. You dead. Number three, Elseworlds Finest. I mostly love this story for the art, to be honest. Elseworlds Finest is quite different from the previous story we had with no Superman or Batman, with Supergirl and Batgirl respectively taking their place. This title of this story and two part limited series was initially based on the old comic series World's Finest, which featured the two heroes of Superman and Batman teaming up on the regular. Basically, it's their long lasting BFF comic. In Elseworlds Finest, we see the heroes team up to go on an Indiana Jones style adventure with Bruce rocking some pretty sweet supernatural and mystical armor, the two must work together to face an evil Russian Lex and defeat the villainous Ra's al Ghul in order to save the world and free Lana Lang's father. Number 2, Red Sun. One of the most intriguing Elseworlds when it comes to Superman and in my opinion Lex Luthor for any Lex fans out there is Red Sun. Red Sun comes to us from the Elseworlds imprint and aims to answer the question, what if Superman had been raised in the Soviet Union? The result is is we get a passionate communist Superman who instead of standing for truth, justice, and the American way, stands for socialism, Stalin, and acts as a champion of the common worker. Instead of an S on his chest, he wears the symbol of communism, the hammer and sickle. Red Sun was a story written by Mark Miller which offered us a different look at Lex Luthor as well, who became the president and sort of the hero of the USA, all as a part of his greater plan to satiate his obsession with destroying Superman. So in a weird way, Lex becomes sort of part hero as as well as the recognizable part paranoid villain that we've all come to know and love. Number one, Earth One. Also known as Earth One with the number instead of the letters. So Earth One or Earth One. But it's also confusing because there's multiple Earth Ones. When it comes to some of the DC multiverse, it can actually just get a little confusing in general as of course there are various Earths that have the same number depending on the continuity we're talking about, New Earth or Prime Earth. Not to be confused as well with Earth Prime. Yeah, it can get pretty mathy up in your brain if you're trying to keep track of everything and separate it. But this time around when I'm talking about alternate Earths when it comes to the number one, I'm talking about Earth One where all of our heroes are just starting out as seen in the Earth One series. Like Batman Earth One, Superman Earth One, Wonder Woman Earth One. You get the idea. There's a lot of Earth Ones. I like how I didn't talk about it, it was interesting at all, I just talked about how it was confusing. Anyways, if you've read Earth One or any of those series, you know what I'm talking about. It's awesome. Nuff said, apparently. 